we'll get started with just some quick introductions uh, while we're waiting for everyone else. And um, again, we're so thank you that you've joined us. Um, I'm Hannah Curtis. I'm with North Metro Small Business Development Center. We help small businesses start, grow, and prosper. And we cover kind of the North Metro Denver region, which includes um, Adams and Broomfield counties. Um, so if you aren't familiar with us and are interested in our one-on-one uh, -on -one consulting, that's a, a big service that we offer. I'll put some links in the chat here for you, um, but you can work with one of our business consultants, um, like I said, one-on-one -on -one to go through whatever kind of questions you're having about your business. And one of our fabulous consultants is Chris Hefley, who's going to be our presenter today. And he's our one of our marketing specialists. Um, so we're going to be really working through how to identify your ideal customer and how to really um, target your marketing to them. So um, this session is being recorded and I'll send out a uh, copy of the recording um, either later this afternoon or tomorrow with Chris's slides as well. So you can refer back to any information that we covered today. Um, and we also want this to be interactive, so feel free to uh, put any questions you have into the chat and we can get to some of those, um, you know, either as we're going or, or at the end, I'm sure we'll have some time for Q&A as well. Um, so with that, Chris, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Hannah. Good afternoon, everyone. I can see some of your faces. Some of your faces I cannot see. Um, I use... Um, this Zoom stuff all the time in my college classes and I have for about a year and a half. And basically I, I still don't like it. But anyway, it's something we have to do. All right, I'm gonna start sharing my slides and then we'll go from there. Let's see if I can find them, there we go. All right, um, just before we start, and this is not a political statement, but I would like everyone to take a moment of silence um, for the people in Ukraine. And thank you. Okay, we're gonna talk about identifying your target market. There's no silver bullet in doing this. It takes some research, it takes some patience, it takes just like everything else with marketing, there's no silver bullet. You have to try things. You have to experiment. You have to do your due diligence. So just by way of background, I've been uh, with the SBDC for 11 years, uh, some of which is in the North Metro office, some of which is downtown. Um, I've had over about 300 clients. Uh, I have a company called the Present Futures Group, which does marketing research and marketing consultation. I was an associate professor for 19 years at Johnson Wales University. And unfortunately they shut down the campus in May of 2021. And now I'm affiliate professor of marketing at Regis, which I really enjoy. All right, any questions so far? Do I know what I'm doing? Probably not, but I've done a lot of customer profiling uh, and that kind of business for a long time. And I really enjoy it and I try to help companies figure out how to do that. Okay, um, today we're going to talk about different methods of segmenting a market. We're gonna talk about uh, whether a segment is attractive and worth pursuing. Uh, we're gonna talk about the difference between various marketing strategies, undifferentiated, differentiated, concentrated, and micro-marketing sometimes referred to as niche marketing. Uh, we're gonna talk about a value proposition, which I'm sure a lot of you didn't expect us to talk about that today, but that sort of comes after the segmentation and after the targeting and how are you gonna to communicate to these segments and or targets about what's the great thing about what you're selling, what you're doing. And then we're gonna define positioning. All right, segmentation starts with establish a strategy and it's called a marketing objective in marketing terms it's a strategy that is who's your target market what are you selling how are you positioned uh, what are your marketing objectives are they realistic uh, and there's a way to actually do that um, which is called smart i'm not sure any of you've heard of smart 
SMART objectives, which means they need to be specific, they need to be measurable, they need to be attainable, you can, they need obviously to be realistic and they need to be time sensitive. Let me give you a very basic example. Uh, you are going to increase sales in your company by 3% in 2022. That meets all the criteria of a SMART objective, okay? Now, if you said, oh, we're gonna increase our awareness in 2022, well, that's not measurable. You can measure awareness, by the way. Uh, usually you have to use a survey instrument to do that, but you can measure awareness. And if your awareness level is 65%, in other words, 65% of a representative sample knows who you are, you can increase that awareness by 5%, 10%. So when I was at Johnson & Wales, we actually did an awareness survey. Um, and our awareness in the Denver metropolitan area was about 65%, which is not very good, by the way. And then after the, we did the awareness thing, we instituted some uh, campaigns where we did billboards, television commercials, social media, et cetera. And we got our awareness up to 85%, which is pretty good after a year's campaign, which was very expensive. And most of your businesses are small enough, you're not gonna do that sort of thing. Um, but awareness is something you should talk about and hopefully get some awareness and measure it once in a while. But primarily when we talk about objectives, we're talking about sales objectives, marketing exec, objective, uh, objectives. And if you're thinking about, well, say you've been in business for 10 years and you wanna measure customer satisfaction, that's a good thing to measure. Or customer retention, you can measure that. How long do you keep customers? How happy are they? That sort of thing. Okay, so then you go into using segmentation methods, and we'll talk a lot about that, and we'll look at evaluating under the targeting thing. We're going to look at evaluating the segment and then whether it's attractive, and then selecting a target market after you've done all this evaluation and making sure you're on track. And then we're going to talk about positioning after that. Everyone know what positioning really means? It does not mean uh, where your product is on the shelf of a grocery store. And a lot of my students, when I say positioning, they go, oh, that's where they put the cereal at the bottom for the kids. No, that's not positioning. Positioning is how you want the world to see your business or your products or your brand and how they uh, see your brand compared to the competition. And a very easy way of looking at positioning is a look at the difference between this watch of mine, which is a, a fossil and a Rolex watch. Their position totally different. Uh, Rolex is a luxury item. It appeals to very uh, affluent people. It's advertised by uh, very rich uh, people and very rich athletes like Tiger Woods and R Roger Federer and Phil Mickelson and a fossil watch, I don't even think they have ambassadors. They don't have people representing their brand. Their brand is fairly cheap. It's for me, it's a great brand. It works for me and that's why I buy it. So when you think about positioning, you have to think about who you're comparing yourself to. We'll talk a lot about that later. All right, so everyone know what a SWOT is. If you were to do a marketing plan, you're gonna develop a marketing plan. One of the steps in the marketing plan is to look at your strengths, your weaknesses, the opportunities and threats that are out there. Strengths and weaknesses uh, are internal to your company. Opportunities and threats are external to your company. So a strength might be, Oh, I've been in business for 15 years and I've been successful and I'm making money. Okay, great. A weakness might be people don't know who I am. I don't make any money. I need money for marketing. That's a weakness. Uh, opportunity is it's a huge market out there uh, and I have a lot of opportunities. I need to focus on them. 
And that's part of looking at your marketing objectives is looking at those opportunities. And then the threats obviously are, you know, the weather, COVID, competition, regulation, taxes, all those things that we all have to deal with. Okay, so here's a segmentation method called geographic. And then there's demographic, and then there's psychographic, and there's benefit segmentation and behavioral se segmentation. Geographic is fairly simple. Uh, are you gonna, if you are a national company, you might want to segment some of your market by regions of the United States, like the Atlantic region, the Southern region, the Western region, the Rocky Mountain region. So uh, quite a few years ago, I did a set of focus groups for Pepsi. <clears throat> and we did focus groups in Wyoming, Salt Lake City, um, Billings, Montana, and two cities in Idaho. Why in the world would we go to those places? Well, they wanted to see whether there's a difference between uh, Pepsi uh, consumers in the Mountain West uh, compared to the South and the East and that sort of stuff. So based upon that research, they actually developed, <coughs> excuse me, um, a marketing campaign using advertising for Pepsi products just in the Rocky Mountain region. What makes the Rocky Mountain region unique? What do we do in the Rocky Mountain region that's different than the South? Do we have NASCAR races? No. Uh, do we have bass fishing? Well, maybe if you go to Nebraska. Uh, do you have trout fishing? Of course. Do you have camping in the mountains? Yes. Do people play softball in the summer? Yes. Do people ski and snowboard? Yes. So we've identified some attributes of consumers in the Rocky Mountain states, and they developed a marketing campaign based upon that. All right, uh, demographic is always about age, gender, income, education. And I like to add occupation and sometimes social status, social economic status. That indicator is not very good but depending on what you're selling, it might be good. All right, lifestyle is about your values. What's important to you? What do you do with your spare time? What are your interests? That's what psychographics are about. Benefits segmentation is a lot about what happens in the grocery store. Why do you buy Tide instead of Gain? Why do you buy Crest instead of Colgate? You know, what is the benefit of those products. In certain cases, it's about money, so it doesn't cost so much. In certain cases, it's about prestige, like Rolex watches. In other cases, it's like, I only buy the store brand because it's cheaper and it's just as good as the name brand, okay? And then behavioral is when you actually buy something and do you have some kind of brand loyalty? Question so far? Okay, so this is the geographic segmentation. The interesting part about this is you can segment a market by neighborhoods and zip codes. And that's an important thing to be able to do if you're a small business. So you wanna focus, let's say, on a zip code or a neighborhood like Arvada, Colorado, and zip codes in Arvada, Colorado. You can actually get information from the census uh, which is, we'll talk about that more, but the Census Bureau does have all kinds of information, geographic information by zip code and neighborhoods. So I can look at Denver County and I can look at five zip codes in Denver County. And I can look at their demographics. So I combine a geographic with a demographic segmentation. Okay, um, especially when you're trying to find customers in a zip code, an area of town that you operate in, that's very important. If you're selling a product on the internet, that may not be as important as some of the other segmentation set strategies. Okay, demographic is the most common strategy. It's easy to measure age, gender, income, education, 
and I put some resources down here. The government, local economic development offices actually have some demographic information about their communities. Uh, there are private companies that sell demographics, or you can find them at Pew Research. They do all kinds of demographic research and some lifestyle stuff. And let me warn you that the, gov the census page is really hard to deal with. So don't get frustrated when you start looking at it uh, and just give yourself some time. And sometimes if you go to a library, they might be able to help you with that. Uh, the library also has other resources in terms of psychographic stuff, but we'll talk about that. Do I need to look at this chat thing? Um, no, I'm keeping an eye on that. We haven't really had any questions come in yet. Okay. But no, All right. I always get distracted and don't even look at that. So, all right. Um, let's see what's wrong here. Okay. Well, it's not working. There we go. Let me make sure about this one. We didn't, I didn't lose something. Okay, psychographic segmentation. Lifestyles, very important. What do you think about? What's important? Or what are your values? What are you interested in? What do you do in your spare time? Okay, and if let's say you are a do-it-yourself kind of person, all right? Um, that's very important as a marketer to know people that they do things for themselves and they build things or they fix their own hair or they mow their own lawn or whatever. And what about their self-concept? So there's various vowels is a, um, it's called a profiling system, okay? And if you Google V-A-L-S, you'll get the strategic business insights thing. And their vowels basically has eight, seven or eight different profiles of people. Now, some of them might be useful. Like if you're giving, uh, if you're, if you're giving uh, piano lessons, because it might help you see, oh, wait, this is the kind of person I need as my target market, somebody who likes music, okay? Somebody that reads books, somebody that goes to the theater, okay? So I always show this to my students, this foul thing, and I show them that one of the profiles they call is called a thinker. I'm exactly like a thinker in the vowels profile. And if you look at vowels and you find the thinker, that's me, okay? I like to do research. I like to read books. I like to go to the theater. No, I don't like to go to the theater. I like to go to the movie theater. Um, so it gives you an idea about different lifestyles. Claritas is a different kind of thing. And in Claritas, if you go to their website, you can put in a zip code like I always use my home zip code, and, which is 80601, which is Brighton, Colorado. And it gives me all these different profiles of the kind of people that live in Brighton, Colorado. Okay, so based upon where I live in Brighton, Colorado, I'm considered a professional kids in cul-de-sacs. What the hell does that mean? That means it's a new part of town I live in. There's a lot of kids here, which is very true. I don't have any living with me, um, but my neighbors do. And I mean, everyone here is basically a professional. Okay, that's good new, that's good information to have if you're targeting zip codes or a community. All right, then we have benefit segmentation. And that's dividing the market into needs and wants best satisfied by a product that you're selling and the benefits of that product. It's behavior. The best kind of segmentation is about behavior. How do people act? All right, so I did a whole bunch of work for BMW motorcycles and we built a profile based upon getting information back from new buyers. So if you were a new buyer of a media, uh, BMW motorcycle, which none of you would be, maybe Diego, um, you would 
give us, we could send you a survey, you send it back, has all the information about why you bought a BMW motorcycle. And it has all kind. we had all kinds of demographic information, lifestyle information, and we built a profile based upon that information. Now, let me, let me bore you with the profile. A BMW motorcycle owner is usually a male, 35 to 65 years old. They're usually a professional. They're usually college educated. They're usually, their occupation is an accountant, a lawyer, a computer scientist, a scientist, a salesperson, somebody that makes a pretty good amount of money. Why did they buy a BMW motorcycle? Because they were looking for performance. They were looking for low maintenance. They were looking for a product that would last a long time, unlike some motorcycles. They were looking at comfort because they use the motorcycle in the summer and drive like 300,000 miles and some crazy thing like that across uh, Alaska or across Canada or some crazy thing like that. And the company has a lot of models that are different and they function differently. And that was a benefit to them. Okay, behavioral segmentation. Uh, the thing I did for BMW is a combination of behavioral, demographic, lifestyle, benefit segmentation, uh, that sort of thing. Behavioral is a lot what happens in the grocery store. You go in, they scan your products you're going to buy, they keep it in a database, they analyze the database and do all kinds of sales analysis, and you know they'll send you coupons or send you something in a newspaper or immediately send you a coupon right there at the stand, at the checkout stand, all right? And then in terms of loyalty, airlines and hotels are very good at this. Also companies like Starbucks, all right? McDonald's on the other hand, you can get an app at McDonald's and sure they care about, oh yeah, this guy always buys a Big Mac. Okay, so they might, give you a coupon for a Big Mac, but they don't really do behavioral segmentation. They segment demographically at McDonald's. Like here's a family, here's a, a kid, here's a teenager, here's a uh, what we call a heavy user at McDonald's is somebody who's 15 to 25. When they go to McDonald's, they spend $15. I never spend $15 at McDonald's. You know, they buy a Big Mac, they buy a big fries, they buy a big shake, and then they might buy a dessert. Um, and that's a heavy user of McDonald's. That's their loyal customer. All right, so um, here's what, which is, this is called Tapestry is another one of these database companies that uh, classifies uh, consumers. And this one is geographic, demographic and psychographic or lifestyles. Now this is very complicated. So you have to have a guide to look at this like Metro Cities one, Metro Cities Suburban Periphery two, that's where I live in Brighton. Metro Cities two means it's a smaller Metro City. Okay, so it's a city like Colorado Springs, not Denver, but you have to have a, you know, a code to figure out all this stuff. But it does have a combination of, uh, let's say that you're looking at this Metro City One, which would be a big city. There's 25 major markets in the United States and Denver is low on the list, but it is one of those. And so you look at the household type, married couple families, average age, median age, excuse me, 45, income high, Employment, they're a professional, they're in management, education, they have a bachelor's degree or a, a graduate degree. They own a house that's single family. They participate in civic activities, which means they vote. They're on the school board or something like that. They own stocks worth $75,000 plus. They take a, a vacation, not necessarily overseas, but sometimes overseas. Um, they listen to classical music, they listen to the news, they watch public television, and they own or lease a luxury car. 
Okay, that gives you a lot of information. If you're selling those kind of products, if you're selling books, this information would be useful to you. If you're selling a lawn mowing service, this information actually might be useful to you also, but only if you could get it down to a zip code, okay? Which is what Claritas did, does. All right, does that make sense? Very, it's very complicated. You need a, a guide to read it and understand it, but it's kind of interesting. Okay, so up here it talks about the segment is the O1 top rung segment. This segment is the inner city tenants, some of which rent, some of which own, but they're totally different than this segment. Questions? Okay. All right, so how do you evaluate a segment? Well, first you have to do all this research to figure out uh, the demographics and the psychographics, and then maybe the buying behavior. In, in most small businesses, you're not gonna do all this stuff. <clears throat> um, if you're building houses, it's probably important. If you're a home building, or if you're leasing offices, you probably need to do a lot of research, okay? So when you're looking at, uh, sorry, I just wanna make sure I don't blabber until we're done. Um, if we're going to look at segments and how attractive they are, we're gonna look at whether it's substantial. Can you make any money with this segment? Okay, so let's say uh, I'm gonna call on somebody. Uh, Diego, what are, you, what are you marketing? Uh, well, actually I'm one of the consultants. <laughs> Oh, your consultant? Yeah. Okay. What do you consult on? Uh, marketing as well. I'm, I'm marketing. one of the consultants of North Metro SBDC as well. So that's why I'm, okay. I'm smiling. <laughs> All right. Uh, Alicia, did I say that right? Hi. Yes. I pronounce it Alicia. Thank you. Um, okay. So I am a mortgage lender specifically. I'll say this week, two of the mortgage projects products that I am um, advertising or, or marketing is an educator mortgage program for educators and also a program for physicians or um, soon to be physicians. Oh, okay, that's good. That's a good example. So when you target your segments, obviously you're talking about educators, right? Are you talking about new home buyers, existing home buyers? Uh, are you talking about people that have been in education for a while? Do they have families? The demographic stuff. Um, are they looking for a certain neighborhood? And there's all kinds of research you can do on that, right? Does that make sense? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. And doctors, that's a whole nother segment altogether. Uh, are they new doctors? Are they existing doctors? You know, doctors kind of stay in their homes for a long time, I've noticed. Uh, if they're if they're 50 years old or older, they're kind of hanging around in the same neighborhood all the time. Uh, if they move, they're going to move something basically totally different than what a city they're already in. Uh, but you could find some information on that. Okay. Um, so you're thinking about is this market substantial? If it's educators, yes, the market's substantial. Right? Can you reach them? Ah, oh, now that's a, that's a little more difficult. Let's say education people and doctors. Okay, you're not gonna go into school and do a sales pitch. And in a doctor's office, they get salespeople all the time trying to sell them pills. So they subscribe pills. So trying to get them, it's hard. It's somehow, re it's, the reachable part's a little more difficult. And in that case, you might have to use email, you might have to use direct mail, you might have to do uh, educational seminars, things like that. And so what do you do? We don't, okay. Um, so are they reachable? Are they responsive? Once you can contact them, are they responsive? Do they come back and say, yeah, I'd be interested in that or just leave me alone? Or are they in the middle of nowhere and they're 
they're hard to reach and they're not responsive. Okay. So is it profitable? Is the segment you're looking at profitable? Now, I would think educators and doctors are pretty profitable. Uh, they're steady, have a steady income. Uh, they're steady in their job. They're steady in their family. Uh, they probably have some savings, that sort of thing. And then can you identify them? Well, yeah, that's the hard part. Now, if you're selling mortgages, identifying them might be easier than some things you're selling. Now, let's say you're selling mortgages to uh, people that immigrate here, okay? Now that's a different story altogether than doctors and educators, okay? They're easy to identify. Uh, someone that came here from another country are, is gonna be more difficult to identify. Does that make sense? Or find them? Yes, my apologies, I was fumbling with this mute button here. Say what? I say, yes, it makes sense. My apologies. I, my, I'm fumbling with the mute button here. <laughs> oh, that's okay. All right. So again, who's the market? Are the segments distinct? And does each segment require a unique marketing mix? That means, does each segment require some marketing that you're not going to be able to do? Like going to a trade show, like uh, doing a seminar, like uh, being able to sit in their home one-on-one -on -one. and are you able to do that? How do you reach them in terms of email, uh, social media? Uh, obviously, most of you are not going to use a billboard. First, because it doesn't work for your market and second, it costs too much. So what is the marketing mix? The marketing mix means how you're going to get to them and depending on what you're selling, how do you distribute that product and what's the price? That's what the marketing mix means. All right, is the market in terms of size and buying power substantial? Obviously doctors have more buying power than educators, okay? Uh, is the segment too small in this case? No, it's not too small. Uh, both of those segments you identified are pretty big. And even though it's a big market, is their buying power significant? Okay, teachers, I think the buying power is pretty significant. All right, the con consumer must know the product exists. Okay, that means reachable. Do they know you're out there? Sure, they know what a mortgage is, but do they know that you're selling mortgages? All right, and let's say you're selling a lawnmower service. Well, do they know that you're even here or even around? Or do you have to depend on word of mouth, which is fine for marketing, but it takes a lot of work. All right, let's say you're selling clothes and you have a location specific place. Do enough people in that location, <coughs> excuse me, know you're there, all right? Um, does do they understand what the product is or what the service is and do they recognize how to buy it that's called a response mechanism do you have a website where they can respond and actually uh figure out how to find you how to get to you all right um Customers must react in a similar way and positively to your offering, what you're selling, okay? If the firm cannot provide products and service to that segment, it should not be targeted, all right? If you cannot provide mortgages to, to people that speak Spanish or people that speak Chinese, then you shouldn't be targeting them, all right? So a long, long time ago, I worked for an advertising agency and we were selling HUD homes. HUD homes are foreclosed homes. So if you have an FHA loan and you don't pay your mortgage, the FHA comes after you and forecloses on your home. So we were selling those homes all over the United States. And we decided one of our target markets were people that spoke Spanish, people that spoke Chinese, people that spoke Laotian, Vietnamese. And so, uh, because we're looking for first time buyers to buy these houses. 
um, because they're not luxury homes. You know, they're, they're probably not great homes, but they're great for first time buyers. So we had advertising in all of those languages. We had TV advertising in Spanish, in Mandarin, in Laotian, in Vietnamese, et cetera. Very expensive, but hey, it was the government, so they could pay for it. All right, one of the things to look at is the profitability of that segment. What's the current market growth of that segment? And this can be the growth in Colorado, the growth in Denver, the growth in the United States. The reason why we want to look at market growth is because we want to say, oh, the, mor the mortgage market, the lawnmower market, whatever it is, grew by 3% last year. Okay, that will help us decide our own marketing objectives. If it grew by 3%, then we should be able to have a 3% growth rate. Okay, now if it's a 10% growth rate, okay, well, that might be based upon a different city than we live in. So if you compare a city like Buffalo, New York to Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, you're looking at a growth rate that's totally different. In Buffalo, New York, it's going to be a lot lower than Las Vegas because Las Vegas is growing so fast. So you have to be careful what you're looking at with the growth rate and the future growth rate. And you can buy, you can look at studies and the census and the Department of Labor has some statistics on growth rates and future growth rates. And I always look at the marketing and advertising industry. And I always look at the growth rate. It's usually pretty good. It's about 9, 10% a year. But in the future, the growth rate is supposed to get up to 20% because of the internet, and because of social media and things like that. And how competitive is the market? That's when you really need to look at your competition and really identify your direct competition and everyone in the marketplace, if you can, or at least a number of businesses. So let's say you're a, a construction company. You can look at the census data and it's called American Fact Finder. And you can look at different uh, industries like construction. And it will tell you how many businesses are in Denver that are construction companies. Is there 1,500? Are there 500? If there's 2,000, 20,000, excuse me, it's going to be real competitive. So you need to look at the competitiveness of the market. The other way, obviously, to look at the competitiveness is to look at where you're operating, what zip code, what county, what city, and see if you can find how many businesses are going to be your competitors in that city. And then how hard is it to get into the market? What's it gonna cost you? Now, if you're selling heavy equipment, it's probably very costly to get in the market. If you're selling beads or you have a hair salon or you are a, 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 have a bakery, the market access may not be that big. So you have to think about that. Okay, this is a, a sort of a setter, set of uh, scenario, I would call it, of marketing to a children's segment under 15 years old. All right. This segment is 60 million people in America. Obviously, you want to look at Denver or you want to look at Arvada. You don't want to look at the whole world because the whole world is probably not your market or all of the United States is probably not your market. Okay. And then right here it says, oh, uh, they're going to adopt your product, okay? 35%, that's fairly ambitious, by the way. Uh, and then their purchase behavior is $500. I don't know what you're selling where the average sale is $500 to someone who's 15 years old. I have a hard time believing what you're selling them. Uh, so that's kind of questionable also, but you just look at this and do the math. And then you look at the profit margin, and then you look at the fixed costs, and then you say, is this profitable? Well, according to this statistic, you're spending $500 million, you're going to make, excuse me, you're spending $50 million, 
and you're going to make $500 million. Okay. Roughly. Is it profitable? Yeah, it's profitable. Okay. Bad example, I think. But it's a good example of how you do the math. All right. So in this case, I would say, how many children are there 15 and under in Denver? And how many children would I think realistically adopt my product? Okay. And then how much are they really going to spend? Probably not $500, maybe $50, maybe $100. Okay. And then you figure out your profit margin, which I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, but there are SBDC consultants that can help you do that. I'm not one of them because I'm a marketing guy. Okay. This, I, I do like this example. This is a long service. Okay, here's the segment. He's got 75,000 homeowners. He's got 1,000 businesses that could be potential customers. He's going to look at 1% of this 75,000, which is still a lot. And he's going to look at 20% of these business owners. All right. Uh, this is rather ambitious. 100 times, $100 times 12 times. I give my lawn guy 20 bucks. Okay, so I think 100 bucks is a rather ambitious. Uh, but okay. And then in a business, I think 500 is rather ambitious also. Maybe $100. Then you have your profit margin, which these are good profit margins, by the way. So you have your fixed costs. <coughs> and then you look at the segment profitability. And obviously, the business segment is huge compared to the, to the homeowner segment. All right. But let's say it's a homeowner segment and you're going to make $140,000. Okay. That's good. How can you increase that? That's part of your marketing objectives. Increase it by 3%. Increase it by 5%, whatever it is. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, the key factor in pursuing a target market, you did all this segmentation. You've identified two markets, right? One a business market, one a residential market. And that mar within that market, you're going to identify some more segments, okay? And those are going to be your targets. <coughs> now, when I ask clients in the SBDC, uh, who's your target market? They say everybody. That's not a good answer because you cannot go after everyone in your, as your target market, okay? You might have everyone buy something from you, but your target market has to be very specific, very realistic. You have to know where they are, who they are, and you have to base your objectives on that one target market, not everyone, okay? So you have to be able to differentiate who they are and you have to get, where are they? And is there a concentration of them, okay? Now, if you say, I'm just gonna go after this group and this group is homeowners that live in this geographic location, that is differentiated, okay? If I say, oh, I'm going to just go after this group that lives in Arvada in two zip codes, and I'm only going to look at these two blocks, okay? That's concentrated. If you're going to try to market one-on-one, -on -one, or what sometimes is called a niche, that's a little bit tougher, but it's maybe more productive. And when you're selling on the internet, one-on-one -on -one is a lot easier to do than just going out and selling by, as a person, okay? Does that make sense? And then you have undifferentiated, and that's the, that's the one where, you know, there's a huge companies can do mass marketing. One individual company has a hard time doing mass marketing. They don't have the financial resources. They don't have the time. They can't use every piece of social media out there. 
and do billboards and do radio and do television and do print. It's just not possible. A company like AT&T, they spend a billion dollars on marketing. They can do that. Okay? McDonald's can do that. Coca-Cola can do that. Budweiser can do that. Because they have the resource to do mass marketing. But they typically, like if it's a beer company or a beverage company like Coca-Cola, they differentiate by products. That's their segmentation strategy. Right? Does that make sense? So I would stay away from saying, oh, we're going to market to everyone. Everyone. Oh, well, let's see. I have a Burmese restaurant. Are you going to identify uh, market to every Burmese family in Denver? Well, first off, where are they? Do you know where they are? Well, fine. If you're going to market to all of them, you got to know where they are. Okay. And then using more of a segmentation strategy would make more sense. Does that make sense? Yes, I have a quick question. Would you consider yes. mass Ooh. marketing paying for, sorry, this is Alicia. Would you okay. consider mass marketing included, including paying for boost on Facebook? Uh, now, okay, that's a good question. You can target on Facebook a lot better than you can with television, let's say. Okay, so uh, boosting a post as long as that post is hitting a very concentrated market, I think you're fine. You're not trying to market to everyone on Facebook. It's not possible. It's too big. Okay? And a lot of people aren't even going to see it. So when you do a post on Facebook, you're selecting a market already, right? Yeah. Yeah. So trying to do everyone on Facebook is virtually impossible. So that's what makes Facebook good is it's, it's more concentrated and it's more selective, especially if you advertise on Facebook, you can really target a lot better, better than you can on Google and some of the rest of them. Nice. Okay, great. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, perfect. I have a first time home buyers event that I, I was questioning if I really wanted to pay for a boost or not. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and move forward to doing it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there are people around that will do social media for you. I don't know. I really haven't come across one that's, that's uh, very good. They just charge you money and you can't see the results. So be careful with that. If you can see the results and they give you the results, <coughs> excuse me, um, that would that's better, okay? Because I've seen so many of these marketing schemes where people are handing out coupons at hotels and they're doing social media, but they never tell you what the results are. And until you have Google Analytics or something like that to measure the results, you're not, you don't know what's going on. It's a shot in the dark. Okay, I just got done with my lecture part. All right, we're going to talk about positioning. Positioning is when you use your marketing mix, which is product, price, place, and promotion. And you use that marketing mix to target customers. And you have a clear, distinct, desirable understanding of what that product is, what you're selling, and to whom. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just got over a cold. Um, so market position is knowing who that target market is and being very clear about what you're selling and what makes you unique compared to your competition. Okay? So um, then you have what is called a value proposition. It communicates the customer benefits to re be received from a product. And I'm going to use a very, uh, a very, I would say, simple example. All right, you're selling a washing machine. All right, there's some, a lot of people selling, a lot of companies selling washing machines. At the bottom end of the market, 
is a Whirlpool washing machine. That's what I have. Okay, why did I buy it? Okay, it has three functions, hot water, warm water, cold water. It has three different loads, small, medium, large. Okay, what are the benefits of those two things? The benefits are, uh, if it's a small load, I don't have to waste a bunch of water. So the benefit is I save money. Uh, the benefit is I don't shrink my clothes if I have a cold water setting. Okay, that's good enough for me. All right, now how does it cost compared to a LG or a uh, Bosch and Loeb or some of those high-end uh, washing machines? Well, they don't have all that, those bells and whistles and stuff that turns on and turns off and is digital so I can set it at three in the morning. I have to get up at three in the morning if I want to wash my clothes. Okay, so that's the difference by you're communicating what's the value of what you're selling your product. Does that make sense? That's what positioning means. And you should be able to describe your product in a sentence or even three words. It's called a brand mantra. And so let's take a brand like Disney. What is Disney selling? They are selling fun. They are selling family interaction, family fun. And they're ex selling excitement. That's all they're selling. And they do it various ways. They do it on cruise ships. They do it in movies. They do it in amusement parks. They do it in stores by selling clothes. That's the three things they're selling. Uh, are they different than McDonald's? Sure. Because they're first, they're not selling food, except when you go into the park. Second, they're selling family fun, which I'm not sure McDonald's is fun but little kids think it's fun. And, you know, they are def totally different in terms of who they are than McDonald's. Now you compare McDonald's to some other food outfit like Chick-fil-A. Well, first they're not selling chicken except with the chicken sandwich. They're not solely selling chicken. They're selling uh, meat that is fairly processed. It cooks fast, it's always consistent where Chick-fil-A is selling <coughs> quality, we hope, some kind of healthy food, some of it's healthy. And it's for people that love chicken, not people that love hamburgers, all right? So think about what you're selling and the benefits to the customer and what you makes you different than a competition. Does that make sense? And you should be able to identify that, write that down and say, okay, this is what makes me different or my company different. Okay, does that make sense? And by the way, it's not, hard, it's not easy to do. Sometimes it's hard. If I had to try to differentiate what I'm selling to my clients compared to what somebody else is selling uh, to their clients, you know, I, I think I'm selling a process that's fairly systematic and formulated. I'm not just selling, oh, I'm going to do some marketing for you. And damn, you're going to make a lot of money. Okay, well, how do you prove that to me? All right, so that's hard to do, but I want you to think about it in terms of what you're selling and what makes you different. Sometimes it's customer service. <clears throat> especially if you're selling a product to a business. Businesses expect more. They like a relationship. They want you to come through with customer service or technical support. Or if your coffee machine breaks down, we'll get you one right out today and we'll fix the other one. You know, they're, they're worried about a relationship, not just a product. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is a look at the competitive offering that you're providing. Whoops, sorry. The competitive offering you're giving, the value proposition you have here, what's your customer needs and what is your company offering? Those should overlap here, okay? The what the customer needs and wants should overlap with what you're offering and your competition should be out of the circle. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. If you can't say, what am I doing for my customer? The customer benefit and what I'm offering, then you got to really look at your business. And it can be very, very minuscule things that are different than your competition. Okay. Uh, let's take a lawn mowing service. Uh, lawn mowing service. You cut the lawn. You do the trimming. You edge the sidewalk grass next to the sidewalk. What would be any kind of added value you could have? Every time I see a bush that needs to be trimmed in your yard, I will do it. Every time I see weeds that need to be taken care of, I will do it. Uh, every time, excuse me, that there's dog poop on the ground, I will clean it up. Now, I may charge you more for that, but it's worth it, okay? That's what the added value is, your value proposition. All right, here's the difference, and this is a very broad look at two product categories, Gatorade and 7-Up. Obviously, Gatorade represents, and their target market is people that are athletes, okay? And 7-Up is supposed to be light, refreshing, lemon-lime flavored. It's not going to have electrolytes in it. It's supposed to be good, it's supposed to be clean, it's supposed to be fun. Gatorade, on the other hand, has hydration, it has electrolytes, it's for athletes, okay? What else is Gatorade for? This is a joke coming your way. For people who are hungover. Why do people who are hungover drink Gatorade? You're so right, right. They need electrolytes. They need hydration. Exactly. I only know this because college students get hung over once in a while. All right. So positioning methods. This is really important. What is the value, the economic value, the financial value? What are the salient attributes? Okay. So you look at these two. <clears throat> power bars, energy bars, whatever they're, whatever they're called. Okay, well, I've tried both of them. <laughs> the saline attributes, this one tastes horrible. This one tastes great. Okay, what is another saline attribute? This is supposed to be for energy. Okay, probably does have something in it for energy. Uh, it's gluten-free. This is gluten-free, so that's no, that's no difference. Uh, this is made with fruit, coconut, nuts. This is made with chocolate and whatever else, I don't know. Okay. Uh, what are the symbols? That means the branding. Power bar, power bar. That means a lot of energy. Okay. This means, to me, more tasty. Kind of like a snack. The symbols, all this stuff here. Okay. The pictures, this is clear for reason, all right? And the competition. So when we look at 7-Up and Gatorade, the value propositions are obvious. All right, there's a thing called a perceptual map. And if you really do a lot of marketing and a lot of marketing research, you can use this perceptual map to compare your product with another brand's product, okay? Um, I don't use this very often, but I do find it useful if I'm going to sit there and compare something to something else. So the idea, you take Powerade, you take Pepsi, you take Gatorade, you pro uh, have Propel Fitness Water and you have Butter Water. You look at two opposite attributes like less natural and healthy, a sweet taste and light taste. All right, this is why water, obviously, is down here. It's healthy and it doesn't have much of a taste. <laughs> and then you go up here and you have sweet taste like Pepsi, which is less natural, 
less healthy, and you have Powerade and Gatorade over here. Okay. All right. So then what you do is you have your target, various target markets, look at this, and then they rate it for you. Okay. Now I don't, I never go this far. I start here and then I sort of figure out, oh, who did, who said Propel Fitness Water is where they want to be in this, you know, they rate it. And they rate it like one for Pepsi, two for uh, Power A, Gatorade, three for these, these two. But I don't, I don't usually go that far. Um, and in this case, they're looking at the market size. Obviously the market size for Pepsi is much larger than the market size for bottled water and healthy water, okay? That's not, I would not do this. If I was going to do this part for my company, I would pick four, two attributes, okay? Like great service would be an attribute and less service would be the other side. And then I would pick price, high price, low price. All right, and then you compare yourself to the competition. Does that make sense? All right, that makes sure that you can do this with consumers and that sort of tells you, yeah, okay, I'm on the right track or my, my consumer doesn't know where the hell I fit in this perceptual map. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, it's not that hard. It looks hard, but it's not. Okay, guess what? It's question time. I'm out of time too. Four minutes over. Well, that was really helpful information. Um, if anyone does have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and I'll also mention those links that I just put in the chat um, are to schedule an appointment with one of our marketing consultants. And that's a great time also to talk through questions that you might have, especially that are uh, specific to your business and to really dive deep into that. Um, but there were a ton of really great resources in there. And I also wanted to mention, I put in the chat, but I just wanted to verbalize it too. Um, we can help at the SBDC. We can help with some of that um, market research for you with um, IDIS World Reports. Um, so there's a lot of different, um, different ways to do some of that research out there. There were some great resources that Chris mentioned. And then there's also the Denver Public Library. Will They have um, business librarians who will do a lot of this research for you. And then you can schedule a meeting with them and they will um, walk through their findings um, and kind of you know, help you understand what that means for you and your business. Um, so tons of great resources out there. One more that I'm gonna put in here is uh, just our link to our general scheduling page. Um, if you do need to meet with a consultant other than a marketing consultant, I know Chris mentioned the um, profitability ratio or something that's outside of marketing. We have people that can help us. Yeah, you need to talk to an accounting counselor. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, so thank you all for those the comments. It looks like it was helpful for you all, and we'll be following up with the information again so you have access to it. Um, yes. I have one. I have one warning. Yeah. If you if you set up an appointment with you with me, I will make you do a marketing plan, which is probably, probably a good idea for most businesses, new businesses. It's uh, a little work. It's a little work, but you can do it. There's a question about the website for the tapestry resource you mentioned. Do you know? Um, I I do not, but I can find it. Okay. And I'll send it to Hannah. Okay, thanks. And I'll include that in the follow-up email to everyone. That's fine. It's, yeah, I can find it for you. Okay. I've never used it, but I like the idea because that's what that Claritas does and the vowels thing. So it's very similar. Awesome. Great. All right. Well, again, thank, all right, you, thank you. And thank you, Chris. This was really helpful. And we um, just hope you all have a great afternoon.